Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 135. Russia is never as strong as she looks, nor as weak as she looks. Previously, we covered Army Group North as it captured Lithuania, Latvia, parts of Estonia, and had penetrated the Stalin line around Peskov and Ostrov. By early July, it was on an approach to Leningrad. Meanwhile, Army Group Center, which had captured or killed the most Soviet troops thus far, was massing its armor just west of Minsk. And Army Group South had left southern Poland and eastern Romania to take Odessa along the coast, shatter whole Soviet armies in its way, and make good progress towards Kiev. True, there was some stronger-than-expected resistance just above the coast in southern Russian-held territory, but it would be of little moment to turn south some of the tanks from Army Group Center to hit those who resisted there from behind. Overall, things were looking good from Berlin's perspective, and while Hitler enjoyed the ever-changing map in front of him, he was always as the leader of his country, looking over the political implications and ramifications of this latest attack. To make sure the world understood this undertaking in its correct context, Hitler gave a speech that morning of June 22nd in the Reichstag. German people, National Socialists, after long months when I was forced to keep silent despite heavy concerns, The time has come when I can finally speak openly. When the German Reich revealed England's, read Britain's, declaration of war on September 3rd, 1939, the British attempted once again to frustrate any attempt to begin a consolidation and thus a strengthening of Europe by fighting the then strongest power on the continent. A side note here. Hitler's speech then jumps back in time, which I think got lost in this translation. And before we go on, now that we've covered the story up to this point, see if you can find every ironic barb within this speech. England formally destroyed Spain through many wars. For the same reason, it waged its wars against Holland. With the help of all of Europe, it later fought France and around the turn of the century, it began to encircle the German Reich, and it began the World War in 1914. Germany was defeated in 1918 only because of its inner disunity. The results were terrible. After first hypocritically declaring to be fighting only against the Kaiser and his regime, they began the systematic destruction of the German Reich after the German army had laid down its arms. As the prophecy of a French statesman, who had said that there were 20 million Germans too many, began to be fulfilled through starvation, disease, or emigration, the National Socialist Movement began building the unity of the German people, thereby preparing the rebirth of the Reich. This new revival of our people, from poverty, misery, and shameful contempt, was a sign of pure internal rebirth. England was not affected, much less threatened, by this. Nonetheless, it immediately renewed its hateful policy of encirclement against Germany, both at home and abroad. We face the plot we all know about between Jews and Democrats, Bolsheviks and reactionaries, all with the same goal, to prevent the establishment of a new people's state to plunge the Reich again into impotence and misery. The hatred of this international world conspiracy was directed not only against us, but also against those peoples who have also been neglected by fortune, who could earn their daily bread only through the hardest struggle. Italy and Japan, above all, alongside Germany, were almost forbidden to enjoy their share of the wealth of the world. The alliance between these nations was, therefore, only an act of self-defense against a threatening egotistical world coalition of wealth and power. In the summer of 1939, England thought that the time had come to renew its attempts to destroy Germany by a policy of encirclement. Their method was to begin a campaign of lies. They declared that Germany threatened other people. 
They next provided an English guarantee of support and assistance, as in the World War. Let them march against Germany. Thus, between May and August of 1939, England succeeded in spreading the claim throughout the world that Germany directly threatened Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Finland, Bessarabia, and even the Ukraine. Some of these nations allowed themselves to be misled, accepting the promises of support that were offered, and thereby joined the new attempt to encircle Germany. Under these circumstances, I believed I was called by my conscience and by history of the German people to assure not only these nations and their governments that these British accusations were untrue, but also to reassure the strongest power in the East through formal declarations that our interests did not conflict. National Socialists, you probably all felt that this was a bitter and difficult step for me. The German people have never had hostile feelings towards the people of Russia. During the last two decades, however, the Jewish Bolshevist rulers in Moscow have attempted to set not only Germany, but of all Europe, aflame. Germany has never attempted to spread its National Socialist worldview to Russia. Rather, the Jewish Bolshevist rulers in Moscow have constantly attempted to subject us and the other European peoples to their rule. They have attempted this not only intellectually, but through all military means. The result of this effort in every nation was only chaos, misery, and starvation. I, on the other hand, have tried for two decades to build a new socialist order in Germany with a minimum of interference and without harming our productive capability. The result of our policies are unique in all the world. Our economic and social reorganization has led to the systematic elimination of social and class barriers, with the goal of a true people's community. It was therefore difficult for me, in August of 1939, to send my minister to Moscow to attempt to work against Britain's plans to encircle Germany. I did it only because of my sense of responsibility to the German people above all in the hope of reaching a lasting understanding and perhaps avoiding the sacrifice that would otherwise be demanded of us. With the exception of Lithuania, Germany declared that those areas and nations were outside Germany's political interests. There was a special provision in the case that England succeeded in inciting Poland into war against Germany, but here too German claims were moderate and in no relation to the accomplishments of German arms. National Socialist, the results of this treaty, which I sought in the interest of the German people, were particularly severe for Germans living in the affected nations. Over a half a million German people's comrades, all of them small farmers, craftsmen, and workers, were forced almost overnight to leave their former homes to escape a new government that threatened them with vast misery and sooner or later with complete extermination. I kept silent about all this, because I had to keep silent. My wish was for final agreement with this state, and if possible, a lasting settlement. But even during our march into Poland, in violation of the treaty, the Soviet rulers suddenly claimed Lithuania. The German Reich never intended to occupy Lithuania, and never made any such demands on Lithuania. To the contrary, it turned down the request by the Lithuanian government to send German troops there, since that did not correspond to the goals of German policy. Nonetheless, I accepted this new Russian demand, but that was only the beginning of their ever new demands. The victory of Poland, gained exclusively by German troops, gave me the occasion to extend a new offer of peace to the Western powers it was rejected by the international Jewish warmongers. The reason was that England still hoped to mobilize a European coalition against Germany that would include the Balkans and Soviet Russia. Those in London decided to send Ambassador Cripps to Moscow. He had clear orders to improve relations between England and Soviet Russia and to develop them along the lines England wanted. The first results were evident in the fall of 1939 and spring of 1940. Russia justified its attempts to subjugate not only Finland, but also the Baltic states, by the sudden faults and absurd claim that it was protecting them 
from a foreign threat, or that it was acting to prevent that threat. Only Germany could it have meant. No other power could enter the Baltic Sea or wage war there. I still had to remain silent. The rulers of the Kremlin continued. Consistent with the so-called Friendship Treaty, Germany removed its troops far from the eastern border in spring of 1940. Russian forces were already moving in, and in numbers that can only be seen as a clear threat to Germany. According to a statement by Molotov, there were already 22 Russian divisions in the Baltic states in the spring of 1940. Although the Russian government always claimed that the troops were there at the request of the people who lived there, their purpose could only be seen as a demonstration aimed at Germany. As our soldiers attacked French and British forces in the West, the extent of the Russian advance on our Eastern Front grew ever more threatening. In August of 1940, I concluded that, given the increasing number of powerful Bolshevik divisions, it was no longer in the interest of the Reich to leave the eastern provinces, so often devastated by war, unprotected. This, however, is exactly what the British and Soviets had hoped. The fact that so much of the German forces, in particular the Air Force, was tied down in the east made it impossible for German leadership to bring a radical end to the war in the West. This was the goal of both British and Soviet Russian policy. Both England and Soviet Russia wanted to prolong this war as long as possible in order to weaken all of Europe and plunge it into even greater impotence. Russia's threatened attack on Romania was intended not only to take over an important element in the economic life, not only of Germany, but of Europe as a whole, or at least to destroy it. With boundless patience, the German Reich attempted after 1933 to win over the southeastern European states as trading partners. We, therefore, had the greatest possible interest in their domestic stability and order. Russia's entrance into Romania and Greece's ties to England threatened to rapidly transform this area into a general battleground. Despite our principles and customs, and despite the fact that the Romanian government had brought these troubles onto itself, I urgently advised them, for the sake of peace, to bow to Soviet extortion and cede Bessarabia. The Romanian government, however, believed that it could justify this step to its own people only if Germany and Italy in return guaranteed the security of its remaining territory. I did this with a heavy heart. When the German government gives its promise, it will stand by it. We are neither English nor Jewish. I thus believed that I had saved peace at the last moment, even if at the cost of a heavy obligation. To reach a final resolution of these problems, and to clarify Russian intentions towards the Reich, as well as under the pressures of a steadily increasing mobilization along our eastern border, I invited Mr. Molotov to come to Berlin. National Socialists I behaved as the responsible leader of the German Reich, but also as a responsible representative of European culture and civilization. The result was an increase in Soviet Russian activity against the Reich, above all the immediate beginnings of efforts to subvert the new Romanian state and to attempt to use propaganda to eliminate the Bulgarian government. With the help of confused and immature people, the Romanian legion succeeded in organizing a coup that removed General Antonescu and plunged the nation into chaos. By removing legal authority, they also removed the grounds for Germany to act on its guarantee. Still, I believed it best to remain silent. Immediately after this enterprise collapsed, there was a new increase in Russian troops along the German eastern border. Increasing numbers of tank and parachute divisions threatened the German border. The German army and the German homeland know that until a few weeks ago, there was not a single German tank or motorized division on our eastern border. If anyone needed final proof of the carefully hidden coalition between England and Soviet Russia, the conflict in Yugoslavia provided it. While I was making a last attempt to keep peace in the Balkans, and in agreement with the Duce invited Yugoslavia to join the Three Power Pact, England and Soviet Russia organized a coup 
that topple the government that was ready for such an agreement. The German people can now be told that the Serbian coup against Germany was under both the English and Soviet Russian flags. Since we were silent, the Soviet Russian government went a step further. Not only did they organize a putsch, but signed a treaty of friendship with their new lackeys a few days later that was intended to strengthen Serbia's resistance to peace in the Balkans and turn it against Germany. It was no platonic effort, either. Moscow demanded that the Serbian army mobilize. Still, I believed that it was best not to speak. The rulers of the Kremlin took a step further. The German government now possesses documents that prove to bring Serbia into battle, Russia promised to provide it with weapons, airplanes, ammunition, and other war material through Salonika. That happened at almost the same moment I was giving the Japanese foreign minister the advice to maintain good relations with Russia in hope of maintaining peace. Only the rapid breakthrough of our incomparable divisions into Skopje and the capture of Salonika prevented the realization of this Soviet-Russian-Anglo-Saxon plot. Serbian Air Force officers, however, fled to Russia and were immediately welcomed as allies. Only the victory of the Axis powers in the Balkans frustrated the plan of evolving Germany in battle in the southeast for months, allowing the Soviet Russian armies to complete their march and increase their readiness for action. Together with England and with the hoped-for American supplies, they would be ready to strangle and defeat the German Reich and Italy. Thus Moscow not only broke our treaty of friendship, but betrayed it. They did all this while the powers in the Kremlin, to the very last minute, hypocritically attempted to favor peace and friendship, just as they had with Finland or Romania. I was forced by circumstances to keep silence in the past. Now the moment has come when further silence would not only be a sin, but a crime against the German people, against all Europe. Today, about 160 Russian divisions stand at our border. They have been steady border violations for weeks, and not only on our border, but in the far north and also in Romania. Russian pilots make a habit of ignoring the border, perhaps to show us that they already feel as if they are in control. During the night of June 17 to 18, Russian patrols again crossed the German border and could only be repelled after a long battle. Now the hour has come when it is necessary to respond to this plot by Jewish Anglo-Saxon warmongers and the Jewish rulers of Moscow's Bolshevist headquarters. German people, at this moment, an attack unprecedented in the history of the world in its extent and size, has begun. With Finnish comrades, the victors of Narvik stand by the Arctic Sea. German divisions, under the command of the conqueror of Norway, together with the heroes of Finland's freedom and their marshal, defend Finnish soil. On the Eastern Front, German formations extend from East Prussia to the Carpathians, from the banks of the Prith River to the Lower Danube to the Black Sea. German and Romanian soldiers are united under state leader Antonescu. The purpose of this front is no longer the protection of the individual nations, but rather the safety of Europe, and therefore the salvation of everyone. I have therefore decided today, once again, to put the fate of Germany and the future of the German Reich and our people in the hands of our soldiers. May God help us in this battle. Out of all the people who seemed not to be able to see the nose past their face, Hitler assumed that his men would be hailed as liberators from the Baltic peoples, as well as those in Poland and Western Russia, who had suffered dearly under Stalin's reign as he gathered their hard-earned harvests each year to sell them to the world and so fund his economic development plans. And to a degree, Hitler was correct. The locals in Western Russia, despite their nationality, welcomed and even cheered the oncoming German troops, as well as the backs of the fleeing Soviet ones. The peoples of the Baltic states, the same.
And to a degree, Hitler had mentally factored this very reaction into his justification of a quick victory. But it was a honeymoon of hours. The German soldiers, under the spell of, or at least constant messages of, Nazism since 1933, saw these civilians as subhuman, or nothing more than things that lived on land now ruled by their warlord, eating food that now belonged to the German race, had possessions, read spoils, that went to the victor. The harsh treatment by the Germans as they came into contact with the citizenry of wherever they were taught these poor souls that life would be no better for their change of master. As for their former master, Stalin, who knew this was a very real possibility, had, before war broke out, some 500,000 ethnic Germans moved away from Western Russia. As for those left behind, there were two laws of Hitler that would rule over their lives. The first, already covered, was the Commissar Law, which indicated that all political officers were to be shot on sight. The other rule was that any German soldier who treated any civilian or prisoner cruelly did not automatically have to be punished by his superior officer. It was up to the ranking man on the scene. And there would be little punishment of the offender or justice for the victim. Though we will return to this subject later and in greater detail, for now the Germans took everything of value and sent it back west. Over time, civilians were sent back as well, for labor, and many of them would die of starvation and exposure. The same fate would fall upon many of those who remained behind, trapped with literally no place to go. As for the captured Russian soldiers, some 58% of them would die in captivity, and considering the numbers involved, some 750,000 captured or killed, within the first three weeks of war, the Russian army would have its soul ripped from its devastated body. Because of this harsh treatment that started right away, it's not surprising that armed bands of men, some civilian, some bypassed Russian soldiers, some a mixture of each, started seeking revenge. And this war within a war would grow to astounding proportions. In time, large units of German soldiers would be held back to hunt down these partisans. As touched upon previously, the more astute German officers began to notice things that spoke of the coming hard times for the Wehrmacht. Yes, many Soviet soldiers had been killed or captured, but not as many as had been predicted, and those that did surrender fought like the devil before doing so. And the way things stood at the moment, just three weeks into the war, it didn't look as if, though, army groups center and south would be advancing east side by side. Considering the trouble army group south was having to push forward. Now, this was an important condition of the planned attack. Only by having these two massive armies support each other could Moscow and the land below it be attacked simultaneously not to mention applying equal pressure to Leningrad, to the north, as Russian troops there might be pulled south to stiffen the defense before Moscow. To be clear, this surprisingly stubborn resistance of Russia's men wasn't because of Moscow heroically guiding its troops. There were simply more Soviet forces to the south of the marshes, and even in victory, it took the Germans time to kill or capture hundreds of thousands of enemy troops. Yet Moscow was desperately trying to lead this noble cause, to lead their troops through this great patriotic war. They just weren't very effective at it during the first phase. Men like Stalin, Commissar of Defense, Tomashenko, and Chief of the General Staff, Zhukov, reacted to the German invasion, at first, by giving orders that the prearranged defense plans were to be followed. Namely, that the men of the first line were to advance and kick the attackers off of Soviet land. When that wasn't working, they fell back on the tried, but not so true method, of just gathering as many men as they could, known as the Stavka Reserves, 
throwing rifles into their hands and then sending them forward, telling them to execute the prearranged defensive plan. But then that didn't work. So it was time for real change, real improvements to be made. Ideology had to take a back seat. It was time to figure out what worked and what could be done away with. And this was done on a level and scale that most large corporations of today can only dream of. New departments of mobilization, training, and defense were established. Their names were changed, and the people within those departments changed. Their duties evolved, sometimes incorporating other departments, sometimes focusing on bottleneck issues. In essence, the men with Stalin, Zhukov, Tomashenko, Molotov, and others were reinventing the wheel. Each decision either brought them improvement, their ultimate goal, or it was a mistake, and calling it what it was, was done away with, not to be repeated. And even though it would take time, too much time, time that would see so many of their comrades die during the process, the armed forces were improving their systems, command and control, communications, transportation, training, weaponry, tactics, and eventually, strategy. Much like President Lincoln during the U.S. Civil War, who constantly changed generals, attempting to find one that could either whip General Lee or at least keep fighting him, Moscow was finding their way, finding what worked. The rest ended up on a garbage heap. The entity that emerged on August 8th, the Stavka, which means headquarters, but formerly the headquarters of the Supreme High Command, or SVGK, was Stalin at its head, was his attempt to bring the various departments that affected the war effort under one roof. Now, without making the listeners go all glassy-eyed, the SVGK controlled the main war council, the State Defense Committee, the GKO. The GKO, again, chaired by Stalin, but also on it were Molotov as the GKO deputy chairman, Voroshilov, Beria, and Melenkov controlled most aspects of Russian military and industrial efforts, meaning also the general staff. There would be further alterations made, but as time went on, and in this we mean days, not months, each member of the GKO received his own area of responsibility, and any order issued by the GKO was the law. To be sure, the Politburo of the Communist Party Central Committee had its voice added to the general direction of the war, but many of the men who directed the GKO were already within the Politburo. So when the term Stavka is used most times, it means the generals and select politicians, that is, the politicians on one side and the military men on the other, who ran the day-to-day operations of the war effort. Carrying out the will of the Stavka, which carried out the will of the GKO, was the Red Army General Staff. These were the men in uniforms who offered up their opinion on military matters when asked by the Stavka. So, through the General Staff, the Stavka, read Stalin, of the Supreme High Command, or the SVGK, conducted the War of Defense. Over the next few weeks and months, these men and committees that came and went figured themselves out. In some areas, Stalin demanded minute control. In others, he did not, or found those who he could trust with the task, and what's better, had the ability to perform that function. In time, the military men advising the politicians became theater commanders, front commanders, or problem solvers to be sent out into the field. The higher-ranking men of uniform were sent out to inspire but also to keep an eye out for inefficiency and cowardice. Both were punished harshly. And there would be other lower committees created, which would then evolve or die away. But one significant change, or improvement as Stalin must have seen it, was to make the political commissars the equal of force commanders and chiefs of staff. This move alone was letting everyone know that Yes, there was a war to win, but it would be on Stalin's terms. And this war brought other changes. 
for those not killed outright by the purges of the second half of the 1930s. They were released from prison in order to fight for the state, though they were still not trusted. And working under the political officers were rear guard units seeking out incompetence, sabotage, and cowardice. Yes, cowardice was really frowned upon. Yet this harsh treatment was not needed. The soldiers were fighting passionately. They may have hated the collective farms, but life there was a known entity. Life under the Nazis had nothing but terror to offer. Still, Stalin could not be too careful. So, L.Z. Meckles was made chief of Red Army Maine's political directorate, just one day after Germany invaded. Shows where Stalin's priorities, or fear, laid. The military officers hated Meckles, just as the ordinary soldiers hated the men who worked for him. But in time, Meckles would find himself being judged and found wanting. As German units were destroying most vestiges of Soviet military constructs, Moscow was forced to rebuild them, but took this opportunity, if one can use that word, to make improvements. That this was able to happen at all was miraculous, and the credit for not completely giving way to German military pressure during all this goes to the surviving senior army leadership. During this reconstruction, army units were made smaller. Concepts were made simpler. This would give the men in their new positions time to figure out their new worlds. Yet when the Soviet, or rather Russian, as Stalin would have said, armies came back from this process, they would be focused and heavier, as in equipment and firepower. Yet, for now, there were so few tanks still had by the Russians that those that were still left or recently assembled, were put in support roles of the infantry. Except for a few tank divisions that mostly existed on paper, they were now reduced to some 217 tanks each. Only later would it be possible to have large mechanized units. So for now, the Germans would see the rise of the Russian cavalry. By the end of 1941, there would be some 82 divisions each with 3,447 horsemen. The attackers scoffed at such throwbacks. But when winter proper came, and the vehicles were stuck or frozen into inaction, it would be the horsemen and the newly created ski battalions that would give the Germans reason enough to respect their striking power. The Red Air Force regiments went the same way of the tank divisions. Now there would only be 30 planes to a regiment not the former 60. And as for the long-range command, it was scrapped for now. Who cared about bombing a supply line or a tank hundreds of miles away when there were so many to choose from right in front of you? But what about the actual fighting, literally stopping the enemy in its tracks? This called for, along with everything else that was going on, a fundamental change of tactics. On more than one occasion, Zukov would order and would yell as he was ordering that the Germans were not to be met head-on. That was suicide. That was what they wanted. The Russian soldiers, whether on foot or on horseback, were to make their way to the enemy's flanks and strike there. And though many of these tactical changes would not take full effect until 1942, it all started here, in late June, early July of '41. Like any other processes, good and bad decisions were made, and the results had to be lived with. But Moscow immediately recognized the need for defense in depth, certainly along the expected roads that led to the major cities. But even here, the commanders, still new to their roles because their superiors were dead, wounded, or missing, had to be told of this most basic course to take. But it would come to them in time. Yet the men out in the field, under them, would pay the price until such lessons could be learned, and until Russia's wartime production could make good so many lost tanks, planes, and large guns. Yet there were mistakes made on the German side of this coin as well. Planning for and expecting a quick victory, studies in depth 
were not made of the Russian military, beyond what was in between the border and the major Russian cities. For example, only three of the 16 mechanized corps had been known of by the Germans prior to the attack. So when the 1st Panzer Corps of Army Group South ran into these corps, their surprise was genuine. But that was only one of three major intelligence mistakes made by Germany. The other two was Russia's ability to piece together shattered units in impressive time and continually offer up resistance. And Russia's, the largest country in the world, access to manpower. The Russians had conducted their own tests and studies throughout the 1930s and figured out that each army would have to be completely replaced every four to eight months, which doesn't speak well of their field leadership. So a universal military service law was created in 1938. So by the time of Barbarossa, some 14 million men had had some basic military training. The reason the Germans were unaware of these things They weren't expected to be relevant. But the simplicity and impact of the above system cannot be overstated. When mobilization commenced, as the men came forward, when enough of them were present and put together with minimal equipment, clone armies of existing armies already out in the field were created. And yes, I was tempted to title this the Clone War. So, when a Russian army was shattered and many were in June and July, another army was already, or about to be, formed to replace it. It is only a slight exaggeration to say that any German tank driver who made a mark on his tank every time a Russian force was destroyed would find himself, in time, whittling down his own vehicle. The NKO, the body responsible for the system, newly created in late June of 1941, called up some 5,300,000 men for the cause by the end of the month. From this number of men, some eight new armies were created. What's more, 13 other armies were put together in July, 14 more armies in August, three more in September, and five more in October. Truly staggering numbers. That they weren't all completely armed, trained, and equipped was not the point. They were put in front of the Germans just as soon as another army was swept from the field by the invaders. This counting does not even take into consideration the number of troops brought back from the Far East, and they were much better trained and equipped and experienced. This was only allowable due to Japanese troops being trounced during the Battle of Nomaham during mid and late 1939 that saw the deaths of tens of thousands of Japanese troops, while the Russians there gathered valuable experience. In short, Russia's ability to mobilize at an impressive rate and bring back some of their experienced men from the east meant that, as the Russian forces were pushed around, captured, and annihilated during the summer and fall of 1941, there were always more men ready to be placed in front of the invaders. By the last day of 1941, there were some 8 million men in arms, counting the regular army, men transferred from the east, and the 25 People's Militias divisions brought forward from Moscow and Leningrad. By that same day, December 31st, the Russians had lost 4 million men, yet were still in the fight. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I just want to say hi to my new members and those who've bought CDs or mugs or made a donation. I'd like to welcome aboard Ola M. B. from Norway, because I can't pronounce the city that you're from, Nicholas M. from Orinda, California, Peter V. from Houston, Texas, Christopher Sverven, but I'm not sure where you're from because PayPal didn't tell me. Sorry, Christopher. Hassan L., Again, I'm not sure where you're from, Hassan, but I'm very sorry. Gavin F. from Moray, UK. Jeffrey M. from Wall Creek, California. Alan S. from Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire, UK. Jeffrey C. from Provo, Utah. 
Ian M. I'm not sure where you're from, Ian. Sorry about that. And Robert B. from Burlington, Vermont. And I would like to thank Abel N. for buying a CD, Volume 1. Thank you. And to Neville H. from Queensland, Australia, who bought a Churchill mug. So, thank you for listening, and I'll see you as soon as I can, probably sooner than you think, with the next episode of Operation Barbarossa.